Um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jason Banta next so that we can kind of stay on track. Uh, Dr. Banta is an associate professor and extension beef cattle specialist stationed at our AgriLife Research and Extension Center in Overton. And um, he's got some great information today on the importance of a set calving season and value added marketing. And so Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, whenever you're ready. We're good to go. Uh, if you can't see the slides, let me know. And Brian, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I would like to share a few comments on Johnson grass um, from some preliminary research projects sure. that we had going on. No, no problem. Um, and we hear you and we see your slides just fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so, so I need to apologize. I should have got some of this information out earlier. Like I mentioned, this is a preliminary study, or we have the preliminary results from the study, I should say, and it's an ongoing study. And we haven't shared those results uh, with the agents or, or any producers yet. So uh, I'm gonna make a statement a little bit different than one Brian made because of some new information that has come to light. And he wasn't aware of that. Um, so it has been very common in the literature to see um, statements in regards to frost and what that's likely to do to uh, durin, which is the cyanogenic glycoside in sorghum that turns into uh, hydrogen cyanide or prussic acid. Um, the, if you go back and dig through the literature, there, there's actually limiting evidence uh, to, to support that, but it just got repeated so many times in history, it kind of got taken for this is the way it's going to go. We were actually able to get a grant and look at uh, cyanide potential in Johnson grass uh, last summer and last fall. Uh, we're hoping to get some more data again this year to add to that, uh, but we looked at um, cyanide levels before and after frost, and we actually looked at them for up to a month after a frost. And we did that in three different locations. And in all those locations, and that was um, the Overton area, Overton and Athens, I'm gonna count that as one because of who was collecting those samples. We did it in San Angelo, we did it in Corpus Christi uh, as well. And in all that data that we've gotten back to this point, the levels have always been higher prior to the frost than they were after the frost. Uh, so I know a lot of people get worried about that in the fall. I would just tell you the preliminary information that we have at this point in time shows we may not need to be as worried as what uh, maybe that level of concern was in the past. And we'll be getting some more data out uh, in regards to that. Also in regards to uh, how much, if any dissipation we see through hay, there's, there's some interesting information that's coming to light there that may be a little different than, than I thought at one point in time as well. With that, I'll go ahead and get into my topic this morning, uh, talking about the benefits of a set calving season and then how we would incorporate that into a value-added marketing program and what would be some options of that value-added marketing program and how we could take advantage of that. So a big one to me when we think about a set calving season and we get that set calving season from having that defined breeding season is the labor benefits are extremely valuable uh, from a calving standpoint. We're not worried about cows calving year round and having to check those cows as frequently. Um, another thing that depending on where you're at, depending on where what your situation is can be valuable is if you're dealing uh, with black buzzards, which have been a growing problem uh, in East Texas, are actually starting to move over into the Central Texas area. Having that defined calving season may allow you to move those animals closer to the house so you can do a better job of paying attention to those buzzards and making sure they're not causing you problems with those calves. And if you've never dealt with them before, um, they do cause problems in our live animals. And a lot of times what we'll see around calving time is injuries to those calves by the cow stepping on it because she's trying to uh, chase those buzzards off. 
from a processing and vaccination standpoint, it's much easier if we have all those calves born in a set period of time uh, so that we can get the help there when we need to. Uh, we can work with our veterinarian to get the best uh, vaccine protocol in place and get the timing of those vaccines uh, in, at the time we need them. Um, and then marketing, which we're gonna spend some time on talking about later. And then just the value of full trailer loads um, so that we're not having to make multiple trips throughout the year to sell those calves and just thinking about the gas and diesel. Now, I will tell you, if you hear a talk that uh, I give later on or, or some comments in some other situations, this is one year with these uncertain markets we have uh, moving forward that there may be some value in not selling all those calves at the same time just so you don't get caught on a market that happens to drop that day. But that doesn't mean we want those calves spread out over time from a calving standpoint. We, all, we still want them calving at the same time. We may just hold some of them a little longer before we sell them. Nutritionally, it's extremely important to have a fixed calving season. Uh, I get numerous calls uh, from cattle producers looking at how do I reduce the cost on my supplementation program. And so the first question I always ask, are we dealing with lactating cows or are we dealing with dry cows because they have very different nutritional requirements that I'll show you here on the next slide. And I'll get the comment back, well, I have both because I have the bull out here around. Well, that makes it uh, very difficult to go in and um, feed those cattle as effectively as possible um, because we're always having to overfeed a portion of the group to make sure we feed to the level of those females with the highest nutritional requirement. And that can be a huge difference in cost and also uh, from a management grazing standpoint and those kind of things, it, it makes it a little more challenging as well. So just to kind of give you a rough idea of what kind of differences we're talking about from a nutritional standpoint, those lactating females will be from about 11 and a half to 12 per half percent crude protein they're going to need in the diet uh, to maintain body weight. Those uh, from a TDN standpoint, those lactating cows are going to be 60 to 61% TDN. If we compare that um, to a dry cow, especially a mature dry cow that's going to be just a couple weeks before calving, her protein requirements are only going to be about 8.5% of the diet, 55% TDN. So if we're having to feed those dry cows at the same level of those lactating cows, we end up having to to spend a whole lot more money on feed than what we need to uh, on those dry cows. Big thing when we think about that fixed calving season is just the opportunities it provides us from a marketing standpoint. Um, it makes weaning those calves much easier because we can do it all at the same time. We're going to need to have those calves weaned so that we can uh, participate in special calf sales or if you're looking at retaining ownership of those calves through either the stocker phase or even the feedlot, you're going to want those grouped together and that can provide you some additional opportunities there. Um, and then having them all in a fixed calving season allows us to sell in groups. Uh, depending on where we're at, there can be some benefits in selling in small groups of three to ten head or if you're taking those calves in a to preconditioned calf sale, They'll co-mingle them, um, and, and so there's some benefits there. And then if you have enough animals that you can actually sell in a truckload lot, a truckload lot would be talking 48, 50,000 pounds typically for our area. Um, and in that situation, if you think about um, uh, calf, just to keep the mass simple, weighing 500 pounds at weaning, uh, you'd need 100 head, preferably of the the same sex and similar age for that truckload lot. You could do a mixed sex load if you want to. There's some advantages there. Not quite as good as if we do a single sex load. Big question always comes about, well, if how long should my breeding season be? 
Uh, and I'm going to tell you, I really don't like to have a breeding season over about 90 days. And the reason we don't want to do that is because the implication it has as far as those heifers that are still nursing that cow getting bred by either the herd bull that gets that 2,200 pound herd bull will breed that six or seven month old heifer. If she's in heat, it happens unfortunately more often than what a lot of people realize, as well as some of her contemporary bull calves, while they may not have reached a full, um, pure, you know, complete maturity there, they are going through puberty early and, and they can potentially get some of those heifers bred as well. So if we kind of think about a 90-day breeding season and we turn that bull in April 5th, so these would be for spring calving calves, or late winter uh, spring calving calves, turn the bull in for April 5th, pull him out July 4th. That first calf's going to be born around January 5th. That last calf's going to be born around April 25th. And you see I went from a 90-day breeding season to a 110-day calving season. That's because gestation length will vary a little bit. We always talk about the averages, but there is some variation. So kind of plan on potentially that first calf being about 10 days early. And if you had some cows that got bred right at the end of the breeding season, you, you could see some uh, on the later side there as well. So if we think about that first calf being born January 5th and we pull the bull out July 4th, then that oldest calf is going to be 180 days when that bull's removed. And there's even some risk there, but especially if those calves are, are older than that, as they get older, we increase that risk. So we want to limit the length of the breeding season so we don't end up getting, getting some of those uh, heifer calves bred while they're still nursing the cow. So how do we convert from that year-round calving season to a fixed breeding and calving season? There's several different ways you can do it. Uh, one of the easier ways is if you just want to go to a 90-day spring uh, calving season and 90-day fall calving season, you can do that pretty easy. So that way you don't have any cows moving more than a few months in one direction or, or the other. Uh, so minimizes some of those open cows in that situation. And then you can just discontinue the herd over time. Or you can go in there and just say, um, I'm going to take 30 days off of each end this first year and then take 30 days off the next year until you, until you get to where you need to go. There's no right or wrong. The big thing I would tell you right away is uh, make sure – that um, you pull the bulls out so we're not having any calves born during the middle of summer. That can be very hard on that, those calves. Uh, depending on how hot the summer is, we can actually lose some of those baby calves. So that's another benefit of a fixed calving season is to make sure that um, we don't have any unnecessary uh, mortality because of the time of year that those calves were born. So managing bulls is a question that always comes up when we think about a uh, fixed breeding season. And, and I realize that can be a, a concern until you have some experience with it. It's really not a, as bad as what it seems if we'll take a few uh, precautions. Um, ideally, when you pull those bulls, if you can get them moved a couple pastures away from the cows, uh, that'll make things much easier if you need the pastures uh, back up to each other. Then if you can put an electric fence, uh, if you have 110 power, that's great. There's some good solar chargers on the market uh, now as well. It's amazing what that electric fence will do as far as keeping that bull where he needs to be so you don't have to worry about any damage to fences. Um, then the other thing is, after a few weeks that those bulls have been away from the cows, generally they settle down and they're not standing at the fence looking over the fence uh, near as much, and they, they kind of get used to that routine of uh, being by themselves or being with those other bulls again. The other thing you can do if it helps your man management, especially on um, a smaller operation or if you're worried about the cow got bred, but then she ended up uh, losing that calf before the next calving season. One option you can do is after you wean those calves, 
So we got all those uh, nursing heifer calves out of there. You could potentially put the bulls back in with those cows for um, a few months before those cows start calving again. Maybe just easier from a management standpoint to keep everything together like that. Um, we're gonna keep all, the majority of those cows all in the same calving season we want. If we do have any opens, you could potentially get those bred and then market them a little differently uh, if you want. So there's, there's some options there, but I'll just tell you, it's not near as hard to pull those bulls out as what it seems and keep them separate. Uh, electric fence is amazing on what it will do. And I'll tell you, most people that I've worked with that after they go to a fixed breeding season, they'll tell me, I wish I would have done it a whole lot sooner. It just makes everything so much easier in their operation. Next thing I wanted to get into was some income considerations in addition to just value added marketing. And then we'll spend some time talking about value added marketing and what we need to do to help accomplish that. So a lot of times there's a tendency to focus on just selling price of those calves. What are they bringing per pound? But when we think about income for our operation, we really need to think about the big picture. So we need to think about how many cows got bred, and then more importantly, how many of those weaned a calf. The number that are weaning a calf is actually gonna have a bigger impact on our income than anything else. Um, and we can help that by making sure those cows are in the right body condition score, that we get a good vaccination program implemented on the herd, and having them all calving at the same time helps us manage that nutrition and that vaccination program. Then we need to think about the weight of those calves, not just the sell price. And there can be some benefits from a weaning weight standpoint. Uh, because of the age of the calves, uh, we tend to have a slightly older age group when we go to sell if we have that fixed calving season versus scattered throughout the year. So really think about all three of those components that are going to impact the income coming into your operation. The other thing is just don't get hung up on the dollars per pound you sell those calves for. We need to think about total dollars per head that was generated because that's really the income that's coming into the operation. One thing we wanna think about um, when we're thinking about income and we're thinking uh, about marketing and those things is always pose the question, is being a low cost producer good? And I hear this comment a lot and it, it, it really puzzles me uh, because if we just focus on being just a low cost producer and cutting expenses everywhere, then there's a lot of opportunities we missed that we could have spent a few dollars that gained us quite uh, a bit more back in the long run. So we really wanna focus on the high return on investment things that we can do in the operation. And this is one that fits there perfectly when we think about value added marketing is there's some costs to uh, the vaccines that are required to go into some of those preconditioned calf sales, absolutely. Uh, and depending on what you're buying and where you're buying, you're probably looking at somewhere between eight and twelve dollars a head, uh, depending on the situation. But by giving those vaccines, we can market those calves at a much higher price. And so, yes, there's a little cost, but a really good return on investment in that situation. Uh, implants would be another situation. Deworming would be a big one. If we forego that deworming to save a couple of dollars per head, we're going to lose some performance on those animals. And so that's some lost weight we don't have down the road. So I really encourage you to think about the return on investment rather than just the purchase cost of the different practices we may be looking at. When we think about value added marketing, we have to realize we have to implement some management strategies to have access to some of these areas and increase the value of those calves. One of those big ones is gonna be making sure those calves are weaned. Uh, if we're dealing with any steer calves that aren't being bred uh, or not being saved for breeding purpose, this is to be sold as bulls to other people. We definitely need to make sure we have them castrated. The earlier in life you can do that, the better off you're gonna be. 
So when we think about those preconditioned calf sales uh, that we're selling into, or maybe we're selling a backgrounded calf, those premiums are going to vary. Uh, typically, we'll talk about two to twenty dollars per hundred weight, um, and some of that may not be always what you're you're thinking about there. Uh, it's not just the weaning and vaccination; it's accessing a different market uh, a lot of times potentially. Uh, typically, on average, we'll think about six to ten dollars ahead. Um, if you're talking about a 600-pound calf that you're selling, you're looking at somewhere between 36 and 60 dollars that you can um, get back on those calves. And if we get it done right, the cost uh, will be lower than that. If you do do some things that aren't the most cost-effective, we could potentially be over that. The other thing, though, we, we want to realize is in addition to the economic benefits weaning and preconditioning those calves can have for us, is this the right thing to do for the industry? It's the right thing to do for the health of that calf uh, moving forward. And the other thing I would tell you, so that 6 to $10 premium I'm talking about, that's generally just looking at the, the preconditioning. Uh, that vaccination and that weaning. But what happens a lot of times, especially for producers uh, who aren't able to sell in truckload lots or would typically be selling individual calves, is when you go into a preconditioned calf sale, they can commingle those calves. So now they can sell them in larger truckload lots of similar types and kinds or big enough lots where those buyers will pay an additional uh, premium for them because of the size of their group. Uh, which can be very significant. That can easily be, depending on the situation and how you market those calves, an extra five to ten dollars a hundred weight. Uh, I would tell you typically over the last um, five to ten years here, if we look at selling those calves without any management strategies, just one at a time, versus weaning, vaccinating them, selling them in a preconditioned calf sale where they can co-mingle them or sell them on a truckload lot. Um, when we look at the preconditioning plus, plus the truckload lot or the increased lot size premium, a lot of times we can be looking at $80 to $100 a head. We may not see that this year, but I think we'll still see a, a good premium on those calves. Profitability of that preconditioning program is going to be determined by your cost of vaccines, really not as big as what a lot of people think. Like I said, very common uh, to be in that uh, $8 to $12 range. There's no reason you should be higher than that, and there is potential uh, to be lower than that, depending on the volume and what products you select. Cost of feed. This is where most people uh, end up getting frustrated with the preconditioning calf program is because they spend way too much money on feed trying to put too much weight gain on those calves. We just need to have those calves growing at a very uh, low to moderate rate to keep that immune system function. We're not trying to put weight on them. We're just trying to prepare them for sale. And we actually don't want to put too much weight on them because if we get those calves fleshy or if they came off the cow flesh and we continue to feed them so they maintain that flesh, they'll actually be discounted uh, at market most times. So really the ideal way to do that is uh, on grass with just maybe just a little bit of supplement. And I'll talk about that more later. The other thing, especially if we're dealing with spring barn calves, there's some timing benefit. Typically, if we can move those calves out of that September, October market into that mid-November market, uh, just by preconditioning them, there's some increased uh, market value just from a seasonal standpoint. So when we talk about preconditioned calves and selling those, we really need to make sure we get them in a cell where there's enough other weaned and preconditioned calves uh, to get those benefits. And if you take them uh, to your traditional auction and you're the only one there, with a wean preconditioned calf, you're not gonna get a premium for that calf because the buyers just can't get enough of those calves bought to justify that lot. Plus a lot of times we're dealing with a different group of buyers. Now I will tell you there's still a benefit of selling those wean calves through your uh, traditional market uh, in a non preconditioned calf sale because those wean calves are gonna shrink less and just by saving a few 
uh, points in strength there. Uh, that gives you more weight to sell, and that a lot of times alone can pay for our weaning those calves. Ideally, what we want to do is sell those calves in either a preconditioned calf sale or a truckload lot sale. So two of the longer running uh, preconditioned calf sales in the state of Texas would be uh, the net bio sale up at Sulphur Springs. That's a picture from one of their sale days. Our Jordan Cattle Company out at San Saba. The other kind of interesting thing about a preconditioned calf sale, depending on where it's at, is if you have some off-colored cattle, if there's enough other off-colored cattle or non-traditional colored cattle that uh, could be grouped together, that will actually, they won't see the same type of discount uh, from that standpoint as what they would if we were selling calves one at a time. So if we're selling local uh, one at a time, we really, there can be a benefit from those black cowed calves or those Charlet Cross smoky colored calves because those buyers can just put more of those together and it's a more uniform group for the, for the next person. When we get into a preconditioned calf sale, if, if we have a little uh, non-traditional colors in there, I mean, we don't want real loud, extremely unusual colors, but like here, you can see calf with some stripes on him and some other colors. They will go ahead and fit into some gr groups of some similar types and kinds. And so you may not see that color discount that you typically would and especially um, red calves sell very differently if we can sell them in load lots or if we're selling them one at a time. Uh, so don't get hung up on the color deal. I just want you to be aware of how that may change a little bit depending on where you market those calves. And even if you don't have a preconditioned calf sale close to you, there can still be a profit made by all of those calves. I'll tell you, uh, typically in our family operation in Central Texas, uh, to go to one of the bigger preconditioned calf sales. We're hauling those calves a little over two and a half hours. Um, and as long as we have enough of them, uh, not enough to make a, a truckload lot at 50,000 pounds, but to make a gooseneck load or um, a, a big gooseneck load, we can pay for that shipping and still come out ahead on those calves. Other options for those value added calves is like I said, if you can sell them truckload lots, uh, superior livestock auction, the video auction is, is a well known one down here. Or maybe you're selling those calves directly to somebody out of the country and or by somebody else that's coming and buying them directly for you. Those would be some other opportunities to add some value. But to accomplish those things, we need that set calving season so we have a more uniform calf crop to sell and then we need to make sure we implement those other management practices like castration and vaccination. There's some opportunities if you're looking to add value from a niche marketing standpoint. This isn't a market that's big enough for everybody to participate in, uh, but a situation where um, if you enjoy certain aspects of marketing and, and really dealing with people, there's potentially some um, grass-fed opportunities or other opportunities, but you have to be willing to work with the consumer in selling that product. And there's a lot of us in the cattle industry that we really like the production aspect of things, but we wouldn't want to get into the, the marketing side of things from that level. But if you do like the marketing side of that level, there are some potential opportunities there. Uh, maybe there's a branded calf program that you, you sell into. Uh, there's some of those out there. Those are going to require some truckload lots as well. But, but there are a handful of additional um, what may be classified as niche marketing opportunities. Another niche marketing opportunity that's really pretty traditional that we don't think about, depending on the type of cattle you're raising, uh, maybe keeping those replacement heifers after weaning or keeping those replacement quality heifers after weaning and sell them either in small groups as replacement heifers to individuals or putting them um, in a special female replacement cell. There's some opportunity to capture some added value from those females as well. So don't, 
don't forget about that aspect if you are trying to add value to the calf crop. We do have to have the right type of heifers. We have to wean them and then we can decide whether we want to sell them as open replacements or breed them or how we want to handle them that. But that's another way to add some value to that calf crop. So I mentioned to really get into any of these opportunities to add some value to those calves, we have to wean them. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes here talking about the goals of weaning programs, why we do it, how we do it, uh, how do we make it work better so that, that those calves perform better in those situations. So when we think about the goals of a weaning program, we want to prepare those calves to perform as stockers, feeders, and replacement heifers. Uh, and remember, if you're keeping your own heifers, you're weaning them, it's not any big deal to go ahead and wean those steer calves as well. But by weaning those calves, we reduce health problems uh, down the road on those calves and we increase performance. And then we increase value because we're selling a weaned calf versus a non-weaned calf. Um, I mentioned shrink just a little bit earlier. This is something that gets often overlooked and we can really increase uh, the gross dollars per head on those calves if we'll work on shrink. Weaning is a huge component of that. If we look at uh, selling unweaned calves, we're typically looking at those calves likely shrinking from 8 to 12 percent, uh, sometimes more, especially if you pinned them the night before and tried to hold them in a dry lot before um, you took them to market. Um, and then depending on how many calves are being sold that day and how long it is uh, between when you took them off the cow and when they were actually sold. So like I said, 8 to 12 percent, so in a 500 pound calf, that's 50, if we just think about 10 percent, that's 50 pounds, 600 pound calf, that's 60 pounds of weight we're giving up just through shrink. If we'll just wean those calves, um, we can reduce that shrink by several percent. Uh, let's just say we gain three to four uh, percent back, four percent shrink on a 500 pound calf is 20 pounds and that 600 pound calf is 24 pounds that we're getting back. So how do we reduce that shrink? Wean those calves for at least 45 days or some programs requiring 60 days now. Really focus on reducing the stress of gathering and handling those calves as much as possible. Minimize the amount of time between gathering and weighing. Um, and then if you can get it done right, you can allow cattle time on feed to fill back up before weaning. So just as I mentioned in our family operation, we haul those calves quite a distance to participate in a certain preconditioned calf sale. Uh, I'll actually have those calves hauled in two days before they're going to weigh those calves and they'll put them back on water and hay and I'll weigh the calves before they leave, then I'll have the weight that they've taken after those calves have filled back up. And if we give them a little time, with the day, they'll get most of it back. With two days, in my experience, they've gotten all that weight back. Uh, we'll, we'll see all that shrink from shipping go away. Now, most preconditioned calf sales, they're gonna apply a 2% or maybe a 3% shrink on those calves after they filled back up. Nothing wrong with that, that's industry standard and you're still ahead of the game because you got them in there early and let them fill, fill back up. So when we think about weaning, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. I'm gonna tell you the way I think works best is what we would call fence line weaning. We would put the cows on one side of the fence, we would put the calves on the other side of the fence. Since those calves are able to hear and see those cows, uh, they're going to walk less and ball less than what they would otherwise. So the more we reduce how much walking and how much balling they do and increase the amount of time they're out there grazing uh, and eating, that's going to be better for us. Obviously a pipe fence works great, net wire fence works great. Uh, more and more of us are putting net wire fences in from a pig standpoint, plus we can put those in a lot of times as cheaper, cheaper than a barbed wire fence. A good barbed wire fence will work. Um, electric fence, just like I mentioned with the bulls, works real well. Uh, we'll actually wean our calves on the worst fence I have on the property. It was a fence that was built 
uh, before the property was purchased. It's actually a five strand uh, smooth wire fence. Obviously there are some horses there at one point in time. You say, well, why are you weaning at that location? Well, we have fall barn calves, so we're typically weaning those calves in May. And I wanna make sure I have really good shade uh, on both sides of the fence or especially on the side that those calves are gonna be on so they don't get hot. So we wean in that location, put a single strand of electric fence, uh, electric wire on that fence. And we just don't have any problems with those calves trying to go through the fence or the cows going through the fence. So you don't have to have the best fence in the world to wean those calves. When I was in grad school, we actually at Oklahoma State weaned in a uh, pasture that the fence between the cows and the calves was an old barbed wire fence that the post, the cedar posts were so bad you couldn't put uh, staples back in them. So you just kind of had to wire that back up. We may have a couple calves crawl through the fence out of 100 or 150, however many we were weaning. Not a big deal. We can just cut those out and put them back in. If they continue to do that, then those handful of calves we may just put in a dry lot or something. But fence line weaning, if you do it right, those calves will never back up. They will continue to gain weight throughout that process. Goals of that weaning program, we want to keep those calves growing at that a lower rate or, or moderate rate. I kind of like to shoot far between three quarters of a pound and in a pound and a half a day. There's just no need to get them above that. We want to look at keeping those costs down. We want to keep that room healthy and we want to allow them time to respond to that vaccine and build uh, that immune function. And part of that to keep them growing is we need to deworm them. Uh, a lot of veterinarians will recommend, uh, especially on those calves around weaning time, maybe a white dewormer in addition to one of our microcytic lactones and you may spread those out at timing depending on how, how you do things but there can be a benefit from a white product at, at weaning, especially when we look at East Texas. That helps those calves from a weight gain standpoint, but also helps them from an immune function standpoint. They makes them uh, have greater potential to respond to the vaccine in that situation. One thing we really have to focus on when we think about supplementing these calves and growing them, and this is a mistake that gets made commonly is value of gain. So for each additional pound of weight we put on, uh, what is that worth when we go sell those calves? And the mistake is commonly made to think, well, if we're selling them at $1.40 a pound, it's $1.40 a pound. Uh, it's actually going to be lower than that. And I'll just kind of walk through the math so that you can see that. If we think about a 500 pound steer selling at $1.45, uh, 500 times $1.45 is $720 is the value of that calf if he was sold at that weight. If we wean that calf for uh, 60 days and he was gaining a pound a day, so we put another 60 pounds on him and now he's weighing 560, price per pound is actually going to go down. That's the way the industry and the slides work. Um, so now he's bringing $1.38 a pound. So we can multiply 560 times $1.38. And so we look at his total value going to $772.80. So now what we wanna do is divide the change in value by the change in weight. So we change the value of that calf, $47.80. We changed his weight, 60 pounds. So 47.80 divided by 60 is, tells us each additional pound of gain we put on that calf is worth 80 cents. Um, and that's a pretty good long-term average that I'll use for budgeting purposes. Uh, if corn gets real expensive, that number will go up. If corn gets real cheap, you'll see that number go down a little bit there. But we gotta make sure if you're feeding them that however many pounds of feed it takes to put on a pound of additional weight gain is costing you less than that value of gain in a lot of situations, 80 cents. When we think about that weaning program, make sure we plan our grazing program so that we'll have some high quality forage uh, available at where we wean those calves. We wanna make sure that pasture is not too big. Um, and if we're talking about those springborn calves, if we do stockpile Bermuda grass forage right, that can work really well to, to wean those calves off. 
Um, just real quickly from a supplementation standpoint, then I'll wrap up. If we were looking at high quality pasture, so we have good growing pasture, I'm really gonna only feed those calves to improve gains uh, or teach them how to eat, mainly just to teach them to how to eat because that's a requirement uh, for most preconditioned cells. That doesn't mean I have to feed them for the whole 60 days. Maybe only feed them for a week or two. Once they're coming to feed and eating well, that will, would be sufficient. And in that situation, I'm only gonna feed them one or two pounds of an energy type supplement, uh, whole corn cut or soybean hulls, uh, corn, gluten, feed, those types of things. Medium or low quality pasture, we're gonna feed to increase intake and digestibility of forage. We would feed one to one and a half pounds generally of a high protein supplement. Uh, cotton seed meal works great. Cotton seed meal cubes can work okay. It's just those calves don't eat that big cube as well. Um, Cotton seed meal is extremely palatable. Another nice thing about it is you don't have to worry about those calves overeating if one eats quite a bit more than the rest of the group. From a room and function standpoint, we don't see the same concern with subacute acidosis or acidosis that we would have with many other feeds. If you're having to feed them and put them in a dry lot or if you run out of stockpile forage and we're feeding some we want to feed them the best quality hay we can. So send that off to a reputable lab who can get you all the right information there. And we're only going to supplement again to improve gains or teach those cattle to eat one to three pounds of an energy supplement there. So you can see nowhere did I talk about feeding those calves 1% or 2% of body weight. Typically that's just not cost effective. And we can't, we don't have enough time to gradually build them up slowly to get them that level and keep them at that level long enough to make that work as well for us. So grass and a little bit of supplement, uh, in my mind, is the ideal way to manage those calves through a preconditioning program. And then obviously make sure we keep a good loose mineral out there for them as well. And with that, uh, that's all I had there. I think maybe a minute or two for questions. I'll Take those if you have them, or if you would prefer to follow up later, um, my e you can get in touch with your county agent and they can email me, or that email is jpbanta at ag.tamu.edu. Thank y'all. Uh, thank, thank you, Jason.